So um, welcome, Michael, and uh, welcome to all those who will be watching this recording at some point. And tonight we talk about the week eight topic on law, fact, and evidence. This is a very important topic, uh, especially because when you talk about whether or not there might be evidence that would justify, or the, or the absence of an evidence that would justify seeking an application for review by the courts, we do so uh, on the assumption that perhaps a merits review is not available. And so we will recall that uh, if there is a, a, an issue about a factual error, especially in the instance when a decision is made by the executive and that decision is really not supported by evidence, then the best way to do to do to do uh, the best thing to do would be to apply for a review uh, by the administrative appeals tribunal. But we will remember that there can only be recourse to the administrative appeals tribunal under the EAT Act of um, 1975 Commonwealth. If there are two important key elements, if there are two important elements, and the first element is that the decision of the executive must have been based on a statute or, or an enactment. So that's the important, one of the first uh, important elements. And the second important element is that for there to be jurisdiction on the part of the AAT to review a decision of the executive, that particular enactment that would have been the base, that, that was the basis for an executive decision must also provide that an application for review can be made to the AAT. So we see therefore the distinction between the AAT Act of 1975 Commonwealth as opposed to the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Commonwealth because while you can have an application for judicial review under the ADJR Act of 1977 Commonwealth for as long as the decision was based on an enactment, if you wish to apply for a review by the EAT of an executive decision, not only must the executive decision be based on an enactment, but the enactment itself must provide that uh, an application for review can be made with the EAT. In other words, the jurisdiction of, oh, hello, Karina, thanks for joining us. So therefore, in relation to the jurisdiction of the EAT, its jurisdiction is based not on the EAT Act itself, but on a particular statute or enactment that provides for the, uh, for the jurisdiction of the AAT. The, the, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977, Commonwealth, however, is different because for as long as an executive decision is based on an enactment, in general, therefore, you can apply for judicial review on the basis of the ADGR Act of 1977 Commonwealth. So we need to talk about um, looking at uh, a lack of evidence or no evidence as a basis for judicial review, especially on the assumption that uh, an application for merits review with the AAT is unavailable because, not only because one, uh, even though the, an executive decision might have been based on an enactment, Perhaps um, that particular enactment on which the executive decision was made has not provided for uh, an application for review to be, to be available with the AAT. Now, having said that, it is also important for us to remember, and this is a crucial point, that whereas if you were to apply for a merits review with the AAT, it would have been possible for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal to set aside the decision, even change the decision and substitute its own decision for that of the original decision maker on the basis of a factual error. So if you know if you had a if if the AAT made a finding that there was a factual error, and it's up to it whether or not the error is important or not. But if the AAT is convinced that a decision of the executive was wrong because of a factual error, then the AAT has the power to set aside the decision and even substitute its own decision for that of the original decision maker. But when it comes to judicial review of executive decisions, the mere fact alone that there is a factual error in the, in the decision of the executive does not mean that, that there is now a ground for judicial review. There can only be judicial review if 
not only was there a problem with the evidence, but there was in fact no evidence. So the mere fact that there is a factual error is not a ground for judicial review, mainly because the mere fact that there is a factual error does not mean that there is, uh, that the evidence is, that the decision is contrary to law. And we will recall that when it comes to judicial, judicial review, the, main, the purpose of judicial review is to fix legal errors or those decisions which are contrary to law. But the high court and uh, the federal court, as well as various decisions of the courts in Australia have, have clarified that a mere factual error does not mean that uh, the decision is contrary to law. Because the when it comes to judicial review, judicial review is uh, of limited means. It does not mean that the courts undertaking judicial review uh, try to have a, a review of the decision de novo. It does not attempt to actually, uh, it does not act as an appellate body that then reviews not only uh, the decision on the basis of the law, but also a, a review of the entire decisions of the case. The focus really of judicial review is really to determine whether or not the decision is contrary to law. So it's all about the lawfulness of the decision and not about whether or not uh, the decision might have been factually correct on the basis of the evidence. So that is the purpose of the discussion of, uh, of the topic tonight on law, fact, and evidence. We're trying to determine uh, in, in those instances when there is an allegation on the part of a person who feels aggrieved by a decision of the executive, he wants to know if uh, there might be an absence of evidence for him to assert that the decision is then contrary to law. So tonight, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain no evidence as a ground for judicial review at common law, no evidence as a ground for judicial review under the ADGR Act of 1977 Commonwealth, and the rules on evidence and fact-finding by administrative tribunals. Now, before we start talking further about the topic, it bears repeating, therefore, that when it comes to uh, no evidence as a ground for judicial review, its original source as a ground for judicial review has really been the common law. So um, we, we will recall that the, the courts have asserted their power to police uh, decisions made by the executive against abuses of power. And so the courts have, have um, have, have decided in the past, and even today, that where there is a decision made by the executive, if it is not supported by evidence, if there is no evidence to support a decision, then that decision is contrary to law. So the courts have, have, um, have um, arrived at that ruling you know, um, for a long time. Now that particular ground, as a ground for judicial review, the ground of no evidence has now been codified under the ADGR Act of 1977 Commonwealth. And we will recall that the reason why it's often better to uh, have recourse to the ADGR Act is that even if it were to be asserted, so I'm what I'm trying to do now is to kind of explain you know, common, the, why you should be going for the common law uh, jurisdiction of the court as opposed to jurisdiction under the ADGR Act. So the reason why you would prefer to seek an application for the judicial review under the ADHR Act is that one, uh, the court in that sense would have uh, particularly broader powers when it comes to, um, to uh, providing judicial relief. Because when you look at the, the powers of the courts, when it exercises the power of judicial review under the common law, you're typically confronted only with uh, particular common law or equitable remedies, which we discuss in, in week 11. And typically, therefore, we're talking about that it's a pandamos, prohibition, or injunction, or specific performance, and so on. On the other hand, if you look at the ADGR Act, the, that particular statute, as we will see in, in, uh, in week 11, has provided broader powers uh, and given to the courts when they provide remedies under the, uh, under the, under, under the ADGR Act. And secondly, the distinction also is that because the ADGR Act, in a sense, is a codification of the grounds for judicial review, you will see, therefore, an enumeration of the possible grounds for judicial review. Whereas 
if you were to, uh, to look at the common law, you will see that the grounds for judicial review are actually, are actually around certain themes like Wednesday and reasonableness or the fact that the decision might be contrary to law or there's a lack of jurisdiction. So it's easier to therefore just go to, go to the ADG Act because uh, there is a codification in a sense of the grounds for judicial review. So as we move through a discussion of this topic tonight, bear in mind as to what no evidence really means as a ground for judicial review. When you speak of no evidence, would it mean, for example, that when a decision is uh, made by the executive, and let's assume that that particular decision is grounded on, on certain conclusions as to certain facts, and let's assume that when, a, uh, when a, an executive decision is made, you know, some factual conclusions are supported by evidence and other factual conclusions are not supported by evidence, meaning there are certain conclusions. So let's assume that a decision is made and that decision is, is based on two conclusions as to facts. And one of the conclusions has evidence, is supported by evidence, and the other one is not supported by evidence. So there is no evidence. In that case, what does it mean? Is that a ground for, can there be a ground for judicial review? And if you, know, if you were to pursue an application for judicial review on the, on the ground that there is no evidence, will your application uh, likely be successful? That's one question. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the, the bigger question we, we also often have to, to wonder is that when the executive makes a decision, because remember, it's one thing to talk about applying for judicial review, but it's also a, a altogether different when it comes to the decisions being made by the, exec, by the executive. So when the decision, when the executive makes a decision, for example, would the executive be required to uh, follow uh, the rules of evidence which are observed by, by judges? Because remember, when we looked at the topic uh, in week eight on natural justice, we know that when a person's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations can be impaired or interfered by a decision of the executive, then that executive is required to act judicially, or as, as is often uh, the way it's often phrased, is that there is a requirement that the executive, observing the rules of natural justice, must act with procedural fairness. So there's that requirement. So when somebody's rights, interests, or legitimate expectations will be interfered by a decision of the executive, there is a right to observe natural justice. But what arises then is that before a, an executive makes a decision, what is the amount of evidence that the executive must be able to point to in order for the decision to be valid and therefore not subject to judicial review by the, by the courts on the ground of no evidence? So for example, um, what if, you know, as we will see in an, in an example in, in some of the problems later on, what if, you know, there's an allegation of um, sexual harassment there's an, an allegation that somebody may have stolen some important things in a, in a government office, and therefore a, you know, a complaint leading towards a dismissal uh, has been initiated. And let's assume that you know, there are 20 individuals who say that, uh, no, he never did it. But there is one single person who says, oh, but it happened. So in that situation where you have an, a preponderance of evidence, an overwhelming amount of evidence showing that the person couldn't have done it, but there is one single person who says that he actually did it. If a decision is really made by the executive and where he relied on that single piece of evidence rather than disregarded the 20 others who said it couldn't have happened, does that amount to no evidence, which could be a ground for judicial review? Now, we also know that as far as uh, courts are concerned, um, of course, courts have to, judges have to observe um, the rules of natural justice, they have to act judicially. We know that hearsay evidence isn't allowed. So hearsay evidence means that, oh, um, I know that uh, Jim did it because Cheryl told me about it. So one of the basic rules of evidence is that a person must only testify as to facts of his own personal knowledge. So in other words, um, you cannot be testifying as to the, the truthfulness of a statement made by another person to you. 
So in, in the example I gave, if uh, Jim said that I know that you know something happened because Cheryl told me about it, that statement of Cheryl is actually hearsay evidence, and courts will not accept hearsay evidence. Now, but the question is, the, that rule about hearsay evidence, does that apply in relation to decisions made by executives? So with the example that we, that we have, uh, assuming that, um, you know, again, there is a complaint against somebody because that person is, is alleged to have stolen somebody, uh, something, a very important uh, material or very important object in, in, in an executive office. But there is hearsay evidence of the commission of, of you know, theft or whatever. The question is, is the executive who is required to observe the rules of natural justice, who is required to observe procedural fairness, and who is required to act judicially, is he also required to observe the, the rule against accepting hearsay evidence? And you have questions about speculation, like, um, so in courts, you, you know, courts can't uh, come up with conclusions on the basis of speculative evidence, because if it's based on speculation, it's not based on, 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 on facts. And, but because we, know that, uh, because we know that the executive is not really required to observe the strict rules of evidence that are observed by courts, even if the executive has to act uh, with natural justice, does it mean that, it, it, that the executive can actually uh, accept speculative evidence? So these are some of the questions we wish to examine uh, in this tutorial as we go through some of the discussion questions. Now, before I continue, would Michael or Karina have any question? Um, you're gonna have to unmute yourself, Michael, if, if you wanted to say something. Uh, I could unmute you now, I'm sorry. How's that? Yeah, I could hear you now, Michael, go, go ahead. Troubled by the distinction between taking out a claim based on the common law, yeah. alternatively a claim based on the ADJR Act. Mm -hmm. um, I heard what you said, um, and from my readings today, the ADJR Act um, is fairly um, condensed in, in terms of what it can accept mm. under under the section uh, 51H, I think it is. Yes. But someone comes in, some a lawyer, someone comes into my office and has a complaint. Where, whereabouts do I make the distinction, well, this is going to be a common law claim and this is going, or alternatively, this is going to be a claim under the ADJR Act? Ah, okay. Um, the, the way to look, so the first thing you, you would need to do as a lawyer or as a law student when you have assessments is, if it, if it is at all possible, you would like to ground your application for judicial review on the basis of the ADJR Act, okay, for at least two reasons as I pointed out. One is that the ADJR Act as a codification of much of the legal principles under the common law have uh, enumerated the multiple grounds for judicial review under the ADGR Act. So it's easier because you enumerate and then you know you can apply for judicial judicial review. Secondly, the judicial remedies available under the common law are actually more limited and more restrictive. So for example, um, if you were to apply for a writ of prohibition, uh, which in a sense is, is in a sense uh, is an attempt to restrain the enforcement of a decision uh, made by somebody acting judicially, there are very strict requirements in terms of common law judicial relief. And that is that, you know, um, there would have been no other possible uh, other legal remedy other than the issuance of a writ of prohibition. So if there is any other remedy that is available in order to restrain the enforcement of a decision, therefore, then, uh, a writ of prohibition will not be granted by a court. So we know, as we will see, when we see uh, week 11 later on, we will see that there are very restrict, very strong restrictions in terms of the issuance of uh, common law judicial remedies. So therefore it is easier if you go to the ADGR Act because the ADGR Act is very clear 
as to what the powers are of the court uh, in undertaking judicial review under the Administrative Judicial Judicial Review Act. So your preference is to go for the Adiger Act. However, um, the, the problem with trying to ground your application for judicial review under the ADGR Act is that the decision of the executive must have been based on an enactment, in, or in other words, a statute. Or, uh, so in other words, it has to be an, act, an enactment or a, statute, or a statute made by the parliament, or it can be on the basis of a regulation uh, in the sense that it is a, a subordinate legislation. So the what then happens is that as far as the definition of enactment is under the ADGR Act, when the, when the executive, for example, passes regulations or bylaws on the basis of authorization from the Commonwealth Parliament, that particular regulation or bylaw as a subordinate legislation is also deemed as an enactment. So the key requirement, therefore, for there to be uh, jurisdiction on the part of the court under the ADGR Act is that the decision is that is that the executive decision is made on the basis of an enactment or a statute. The problem, however, as we know, is that number one, not all decisions made by the executive will be based on an enactment. So, for example, we know that as far as the executive is concerned. Its sources of power are not only the statutes which are uh, which become the source of power to the executive, but it also has what are known as inherent executive powers. So the power, for example, of the executive to enter into contracts, the power of the executive to um, enter into treaties, to negotiate trade agreements with other countries, the power of the executive to uh, to pardon prisoners or to commute sentences. These are known as inherent executive powers. You don't need statutory authorization for that. And we also know that another source of the power of the executive is really the uh, Section 61 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. So given the fact, therefore, that the executive has actually multiple sources of its powers, of its executive powers, and we know, therefore, that the powers of the executive are not always based on an enactment, when, therefore, an executive makes a decision not based on, the, on an enactment, but on the basis of certain, for example, inherent executive powers, then you cannot have recourse under the ADJR Act. Yeah. You also need to remember that it is possible that uh, you might have uh, an executive who does have powers under, the, uh, under an enactment, but actually that particular decision made by the executive is not based on an enactment, but based on the common law of contracts. So, um, you know, uh, a, a common law agency such as maybe the Australian Federal Police is certainly a creation of um, the AFP Act coming from the common law of parliament. But in many cases, the AFP might be acting not on the basis of the particular statute, but on its inherent, on the inherent powers of the executive, whether it's the power to, to hire individuals, it's the power to uh, purchase, um, you know, supplies and enter into agreements. So it is not always the case that an executive relies on statutory power, even if it exists, when it, you know, um, enters into particular transactions. So the only time, therefore, that you can rely on the ADGR Act as a source of an application for judicial review is when the executive decision is based on an enactment. So that is always your question. Has yeah, it been made under the enactment? Un, under enactment, if it is, then potentially you can apply for judicial review under the ADJ Act. If one, you've got grounds for it, and two, you can actually see that um, there are judicial review remedies that would work to your advantage. Okay, so we're good. Questions? And okay, let's continue then. Now, uh, we're going to look at quiz seven, as I said, because what we hope to do is to just look at the legal principles that are being assessed in the quiz. Uh, and um, in, in going through some of these legal principles, you then, as students, become put, are put in a better position to provide the correct answer to the quiz. Uh, I don't really provide the answer, but in the process of you know, going through the quiz, questions and uh, answer choices, you should be in a better position to actually come up with the correct answer, and especially now because you're given two attempts, you're allowed two attempts to, to answer the quiz. Uh, 
So can I ask either Michael or Karina to, re to read uh, quiz seven for us? I can read for you. Karina, yes, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, Roman, Roman Quotson, a top executive of a federal government agency, was dismissed from service after an investigation that an internal disciplinary hearing determined that he had an engaged um, in an um, inappropriate relationship with a female staff member. The dismissal of Quotson was not based on statute, but on the exercise of the inherent, inherent executive powers of his superiors at the federal government agency. Responding to a newspaper reporter's question about his dismissal, Quotson said, I'm the victim of a scandal mongers who wants my job. I know. Um, I now look forward to exonerating myself from allegations which are full, false, malicious, and incorrect. I can assure you that I have not done anything inappropriate. Quasson was has come to you a solicitor for legal advice. He wants to know if he can apply for judicial review of his dismissal from in, um, government service on account of what he claims to be an incorrect finding of the fact, of facts. He asserts that whilst he agreed that there, there is some evidence that he had engaged in an inappropriate relationship with a female staff member, the evidence is very weak. Go on, Karina, please. What advice would you give him? Where, where there is an incorrect finding of facts, the result in the findings and decision being contrary to law. Hence, judicial review is available. Quotson can apply for judicial review under Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977 Commonwealth. Under the facts, Quotson has recourse to Administrative Appeals Tribunal in an ap application for merit review. If it, can be if it can be established that the Internal Disciplinary Committee made an incorrect finding of facts, then Quotson's right to natural justice was breached and he can apply for judicial review. All of the answers are wrong. Okay, very good. So let's assume that, you know, we've got A, B, C, D, E. Can you just try typing uh, what do you think is the correct answer in the chat box? This doesn't really count because, you know, this is just for the purpose of tonight's activity. Assuming this is A, B, C, D, and E, I'm just going to change that now. And of course, in the test, or maybe that's one, two, three, four, five, hang on. So let's assume it's A, B, C, D, and E. And of course, in the quiz, I do shuffle the questions. But for the purpose of this particular tutorial, can you try to come up with an answer to the quiz and type it in the chat box? Just so I see. No one's going to see the answer to, the, to, to uh, your answer anyway, because this isn't captured in the recording. What's in the chat box doesn't appear in the recording. So just for, for, for me, and so we could have a discussion from there. Karina, Michael, between, you know, can answer A, B, C, D, or E. Does anyone answer? Ah, okay, so from Karina. Okay, very good. So there is one correct answer there. So some one of you made the correct answer. Okay, very good. And I think the one who's smiling knows the answer. Now, let me just go back to the quiz. Let's go back to the quiz. And I'm going to explain something here. Okay. Looking at the facts, the facts said that the dismissal of Quazon was, based, was not based on statute. So that alone will give you an idea already. If the decision was not based on a statute, it was based on an enactment, the question is, can there be a judicial review under the ADGR Act? And we discussed that already, right? Okay, that's one. Now two, we also know that the jurisdiction of the AAT in an application for marriage review only arises when one, not only must the decision be based on an enactment, but that particular enactment must itself provide that an application for, for marriage review can be had with the AAT. So there is a dual requirement in relation to the AAT's jurisdiction itself. So in the first place, therefore, 
if the decision was not based on an enactment, certainly you cannot have jurisdiction by the AAT. I mean, that should be clear. And, I, and I'm saying that just to clarify principles because I can't remember what the answers were. Okay, now, we've, do, we've done that. We also see here that uh, Quadson admits, uh, alleges that there is an incorrect finding of facts. Okay. And, but he says the evidence is very weak. What do you think? Would Michael or Karina wish to, uh, you know, hasten a guess or, you know, try to provide an answer? If somebody says that the evidence is weak and therefore, and the person says, you know, there is an incorrect finding of facts, but he admits there is some evidence, but the evidence is weak. Does that amount to, to no evidence, which can then be a ground for judicial review? Is that the same? The evidence is weak, therefore no evidence. Is that the same? Aha. Uh -huh. So very good. So have a look at that. And I think, uh, you know, Michael is getting the correct answer and also Karina, very good. Let me just address the issue about uh, natural justice. What we recall is that as far as natural justice is concerned, or the, you know, the right to procedural fairness, there are two key elements to the right to natural justice. And um, one of them is that the person must be given an opportunity to be heard. So someone whose rights, interests, or legitimate expectations are interfered with by the executive, then that person must be given uh, the right to natural justice. And in particular, he must be given an opportunity to be heard. The second is that the person making the decision uh, must act with fairness. He mustn't have any bias. Okay, now, what it does say is that simply because a, an executive makes a decision that is probably not based on any evidence, does not mean that he has breached the right to natural justice because it is not part of the right to natural justice that the decision has to be based on evidence. That is a separate ground altogether. Are we clear? So the right to natural justice um, is in relation to things, to two things. One, that the person must be, heard, must be given an opportunity to be heard. So for as long as a person is given an opportunity to be heard, the mere fact that you know, uh, the decision is not based on evidence does not mean that there is a breach of natural justice. There might be a breach of some other right. There might be a ground for you know, judicial review on some other ground, but it, it cannot be on the basis of a breach of natural justice. For as long as somebody has been heard by an unbiased or impartial decision maker. Okay, so we've covered that, and I think you should have gotten that right. Very good. Let's, so let's proceed to problem one. Michael, do you mind reading question problem one for us? Cornelius James, a senior manager of the Department of Social Services, was fired from his job after the DSS invest, investigative panel found him to have committed sexual harassment against Jill Lockworth, his subordinate. The disciplinary proceeding against Mr. James had been based on the Public Sector Ethical Standards Act, Commonwealth, which prohibits sexual harassment. In its decision, the DSSIP gave more weight to the lone and uncorroborated statement of Ms. Lockwood that on the 23rd of March, she had been groped by Mr. James whilst she was at his office. Mr. James, on the other hand, presented evidence of his good character and lack of history of any allegations of sexual harassment. Eight witnesses who were just outside the office of Mr. James when the alleged incident of sexual harassment was supposed to have occurred also gave evidence that the incident could not have happened. Mr. James asserts that the DSSIP decision is unlawful since it is totally unreasonable, illogical, and contrary to overwhelming evidence, and is patently based on factual errors. He has come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise Mr. James on the validity or invalidity of the decision of the DSSIP. Very good. Thank you, Michael. So here we will notice that um, on the one hand, there are eight witnesses who say that the alleged uh, sexual harassment couldn't have taken place. But we have one individual, uh, the victim herself, Ms. Lockworth, who says it did happen. Eight versus one. So 
let's begin by before you give advice to you know if you were the solicitor before you provide advice to Mr. James who had been fired from his job. What do you suppose is the legal issue here? Let's begin with the legal issue because we said if you identify the legal issue, then you can then state and articulate what the relevant legal rules are or legal principles are. And when you apply the rules to the facts, then you can make an argument as to you know, whether the decision might be valid or invalid. And then it's easy for you to come up with a conclusion. What do you suppose is the legal issue? Whether go on. Whether the circumstances of the case demonstrate that there is no evidence as a ground for judicial review under the mm. ADJR Act. Very good. I, I'd be very happy with that kind of um, with that kind of formulation of the legal issue because, as you pointed out, Michael, it's all about no evidence as a ground for judicial review under the ADJR Act. Very good. Now, in a nutshell. So having identified what the legal issue is, and the legal issue is really all about whether or not um, the decision, there is no evidence to support the decision, which then becomes a ground for judicial review. What do we remember to be the rule or rules in relation to no evidence as a ground for judicial review? Does, so in particular, you know, would it mean that um, if there are factual errors, if the evidence is not overwhelming, does that mean that there is no evidence as a ground for judicial review? What do we remember about the rule on no evidence? Was it something to do with whether or not there's sufficient evidence to substantiate the element Mm -hmm. of the section that has been relied on in making that decision. Okay. Let's just focus for now on the allegation that there is evidence, but the evidence is weak. Or there is evidence, but the evidence isn't overwhelming. The question we have is, is that similar to no evidence? So does it mean that every factual error, assuming that there is a, you know, a huge factual error, does it mean that there is therefore no evidence or that there, that, so that on the basis of an absence of, ever, of evidence, that would then constitute an error of law? Because remember what the, the role of the course is to police or to correct errors of law. What is the rule there? Um, the decision should have been, should not have been seriously irrational or illogical. Okay. Um, in that case, that's kind of Wednesday and reasonableness. Mm. Okay, um, you're right. So if, if you argue that uh, of Wednesday and reasonableness, then the decision must be such that the, no reasonable authority could arrive at such a decision. Okay, but that is a separate ground. Although related to, to um, the no evidence rule, it's actually a separate ground altogether. So we know, for example, they're similar in the sense that when a decision is made and there is no evidence to support a decision, then we can argue that it would be Wednesbury, it would amount to Wednesbury and reasonableness when the executive arrives at the decision anyway, when there is no evidence. So but th that is one, it's related to no evidence. But the, the bigger question we really have is what is the, the rule here? So let me just state it for you because I'm concerned you know, it's 640 now. The basic rule is that the mere fact that there is a factual error in the decision of the executive does not amount to an error of law. The mere fact that there is a factual error does not mean that there is no evidence. The mere fact that evidence might be weak does not mean that there is no evidence. So the, old, the, the only time that you can argue that there is a ground for judicial review on the ground of, of lack of evidence is that there is in fact an absence of evidence. So when there is some evidence to support the decision, you cannot say that there is no evidence. Are we clear? So as a matter of law, and so therefore you can see how restrictive the rule, the, that particular ground is. You, you, you can see how limited it is. The only time you can argue 
that, the, that you know, there is a ground for judicial review is when there is no evidence to support the decision because an absence of evidence would constitute an error of law. But the mere fact that the evidence is weak or it is not supported by overwhelming evidence does not mean that there is no evidence. And even if there were a factual error made in the decision does not nullify the executive decision itself because it is not the duty of the courts to correct factual errors. The courts will only intervene in that circumstance when there is no evidence to support the decision. Now, under the facts, if I were to apply the, fact, the, the rules to the facts, we can see here that there is some evidence. Even, um, even uh, James admits that there is evidence. The evidence is from Ms. Luckworth that you know, sexual harassment had been committed. But according to Mr. James, the evidence is weak because there are eight other people who say it never happened. But the fact remains that there is, in fact, evidence coming from, from Ms. Luckworth. So there is evidence, and because there is evidence to support the decision, then there can be no claim that there is an absence of evidence as to amount to an error of law. So as a solicitor, I would advise Mr. James that it would be uh, it would not be wise for him to try to apply for judicial review because um, there is evidence to support the decision and he cannot argue that there is an absence of evidence uh, for the decision that would constitute an error of law and then which would then uh, enable uh, an application for judicial review. Now let's go to question two. I'm ready for you. Yeah, okay, Karina, go ahead. Yeah, under the same facts above, Mr. James asserts that the SSIP decision constitutes an error of law since the preponderance of evidence overwhelmingly shows that the alleged sexual harassment could not have happened, could not have occurred. Eight witnesses who were just outside of the office of Mr. James when the alleged incident of sexual harassment was supposed to have occurred had given evidence that the incident could not have happened. What advice would you as a solicitor give Mr. James? Thank you, Karina. So this is just a kind of a reiteration of the previous facts. So just to move on, I'm just gonna provide the answer here. So again, the point raised by Mr. James is that the evidence, the preponderance of evidence overwhelmingly favors him. Because he said, you know, eight witnesses said it couldn't have happened, even if Ms. James, uh, Ms. Lockwood said it did. Now, as far as the decisions of the executive are concerned, it's never a question of, you know, where the, uh, the, uh, the balance of evidence lies. That's not the question. The only question really that would then allow for an application for judicial review on the ground of no evidence is that there is an absence of evidence. Under the facts, there is evidence supplied by Ms. Lockwood notwithstanding the fact that eight others said it couldn't have happened. So because there is evidence, there is, there can, it's difficult to argue that there is an absence of evidence that would allow uh, an application for judicial review. So my advice to Mr. James would be, you cannot apply for judicial review on the ground that there is no evidence to support the decision because there is evidence supplied by Ms. Lockwood. Okay, let's look at problem three. Michael, can you read that question for us? Ashley Groves, an IT specialist of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, Australia's National Security Agency, was accused of unlawfully copying and downloading into a thumb drive sensitive information from an ASIO computer. At an internal disciplinary hearing, evidence was received from at least 10 ASIO personnel that at the time and day, being a Sunday, of the alleged, oh, sorry, of the illegal download of information, Groves was the only person in the area in which a computer had been accessed to illegally download the information. Following this evidence, the Internal Disciplinary Hearing Board decided that Groves was more likely than not to have committed the illegal download of information and consequently terminated her employment. Groves has come to you for advice. What advice would you, as a solicitor, give her? Okay, very good. So we let me just um, highlight some factual matters here, and it is that 
Uh, so evidence was based on statements from people that it was likely Groves who did it because he was the only one who was there. They did not say that they actually saw Groves, you know, stealing information. They just said, oh, but it was just, you know, Groves was there. So like, most likely he did it. So let's assume that, you know, you can say, oh, but that's speculation. That's a conjecture, mm. right? Mm. The question now is, um, you know, on the basis of what we can say is conjecture, you know, that, so we would say that the decision was made on the basis simply of conjecture or speculation, even if it was made by, um, how many people were there? By several individuals, okay. but it is still speculation. What is the legal issue? And then, you know, what are the rules? So what would be, what would be the legal issue here? And let's try to use the concept of conjecture or speculation. So let's agree that the, that the decision is based on a conjecture or speculation. Would it be, should ACO consider speculative evidence in making decisions against Mr. Ashley Groves or? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're getting closer there, Karina, because you use the word speculation. I, I still think that there is another way of um, uh, phrasing the, the issue, the legal issue. I think it's the first time I've seen Karina. <laughs> Where do you live, Karina? <laughs> Where do you live? Uh, I live in Melbourne. I recently uh -huh. moved from Sydney. Oh, how cold is it there now? Um, it's not very cold, actually, recently, but uh, it was very cold. Uh, it's very, um, very cold for a while, but yeah, it's, okay. it's actually, I can feel it. It's a spring. It's really nice. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> you've got the sun, but it's kind of cold. Yeah. So it's not hot. Very good. How about you, Michael? Where are you, where are you based? I'm down at uh, Mount Gambia. Where's that? Where's Mount Gambia in South Australia. South Australia. Right down the bottom. Oh, okay. The southeast. Yeah. Ah, how good is the internet there? Uh, well, I'm 20, 20 odd minutes out of town, out of Mangambia yeah. on a rural property, and uh, it's working. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I was, sorry, I'm kind of digressing here, but you know, I have to make the statement. I, I went to Tasmania two weeks ago on my honeymoon, okay? My third, my third, my third honeymoon. We went to Tasmania with my new wife, and um, we went to the Port Arthur. Down in Tasmania, uh, near you know a few kilometers away from Hobart, and there was a huge area there where there was no internet connection. Oh. And I, 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 I never thought that there were parts of Australia where there was no internet connection. I just assumed, you know, being Australia, everybody must have internet connection, especially our students. And then I realized, oh no. There are so many black spots, it's not funny. Yeah. yeah, I was surprised. Like, because that was Port Arthur. But actually, Port Arthur was different because do you know how many, how many people live there? No, it must not, be very little. Yeah, about 200. Yeah, there's not that many. <laughs> I never realized that there were areas where there were so few pe people living. So anyway, that was good, you know, that was good um, new information for me. Anyway. So, didn't I, I hear some time yeah. ago that the internet here is worse than Kazakhstan or something like that? <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would okay. I wouldn't be surprised because I lived in New no. Zealand for about five years and we had better internet connection there. Yeah. <laughs> Which is surprising. Yeah. Well, mm. okay. Maybe because of the cost, the the population density is not cannot um, really justify the cost of making. Um, the internet available in everywhere because the area is so large. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, the break-even point is too high. That's okay. true. That's true. <laughs> You're right. Okay, now going back to problem three. Um, shall I try to formulate the legal issue? Or, Michael, would you like to attempt? 
Uh, you say the word. I was pretty. I was pretty close to Karina. I was. Mm. How would you? How would you state it? Um. Has. Has uh, Asio. Uh, or does does Groves have uh, a claim pursuant to the ADJR Act in that the that ASIO has accepted um, statements that are not in fact evidence or words to that effect? <laughs> You're making a conclusion there. That the statements are not evidence. You, I'd like you to use the word conjecture or speculation here and make it simpler. Remember, the purpose of identifying the legal issue is that we can then articulate what the rules are. So, yeah. if by stating the legal issue, you still cannot articulate what the legal rules are, you need to rephrase or restate your legal issue. Can I offer a legal issue? The way I would identify it would be this. I would say the legal issue is this. Um, would a decision that is based on speculation or conjecture signify that there is evidence to support a decision? Or would the use of, if, if a decision is based on conjecture or evidence, does that constitute a lack of evidence that can be a ground for judicial review? How does that sound? But isn't yeah. what they've, the 10 AGO personnel have said mm. evidence, but it's the quality of the evidence that's an issue? Because mm. he was the, the or she was the only one there at yeah. that computer at the time that the illegal downloads have occurred. So yes. what they've given is evidence, yet has has the has the quality of the evidence very uh, been such that that the decision then. Comes yeah, that's in a very good point of raise, Michael, because you were saying there is evidence. There are you know uh, ten ASIO personnel who said you know something happened, but what if the evidence is speculative evidence? So we go back to that basic question. If evidence is speculative, so speculative evidence is evidence, but what if the evidence is speculative or based on conjecture? Would it mean that speculative evidence can, in fact, mean that there is no evidence to support a decision so that on the basis of an absence of evidence, you can apply for judicial review? So the basic question is, is speculative evidence, if, is a decision based solely on speculative evidence equivalent to a lack of evidence as to ground an application for judicial review on the basis of no evidence. What is the rule? And the rule is that if a decision is based merely on conjecture, that will be insufficient to support a finding of fact. So let me repeat, the rule in the case of Rawson Finances Propriety Limited versus Commissioner of Taxation in a decision of the Federal Court of Australia the court said that if a decision is based on a mere conjecture, it is evidence, yes, but that would be insufficient to support a finding of fact. And therefore, you can say that there is no evidence. And in, the, in this particular case, because the decision was based totally on, on conjecture or speculation, then there was no evidence to support a finding of fact. And because there was no evidence to support a finding of fact, there is a ground for judicial review on the abs on the ground of absence of evidence. So the case is uh, Rawson Finances Proprietary Limited versus Commissioner of Taxation. Rawson spelled as R A W S O N. Finances Proprietary Limited. I'm, I will be posting the uh, suggested answers to the to the discussion questions tonight, so you can see the 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 uh, the case there. Okay, so I would so as if I were the solicitor, I would then advise Groves that he should apply for judicial review on the ground that there is no evidence to support the decision. 
And because there is no evidence to support the decision, because the evidence was merely based on conjecture, uh, then there is an error of law. And the reason for this is that the, that the federal court, in the case of Rawson, proprietary limited versus Commission of Taxation, had said that a decision that is based on a mere conjecture uh, is insufficient to support a finding of fact. Okay. Why don't we do one more before we end tonight's session? I, I may have two, but you know, we could probably end here. Karina, you can you read the question? Yes, can you read the question for us, please? Thank okay. you. Manfred Brown, um, a top executive of the federal government agency, was dismissed from service after an investigation. An internal disciplinary hearing found him guilty under the Work Safety Act, Commonwealth of Bullying, Anwa Olama, his, his uh, subordinate. The act provides that bullying is a repeated verbal, physical, social, and physiological abuse by the employer. Uh, an employer, manager, or superior of an employee or subordinate at work. Is that coming from? Oh, sorry. Hang on, sorry, sorry. Okay. At the dis disciplinary hearing, five witnesses testified that during an office meeting in November, Brown had in front of many other employees and managers shouted at and made racist remarks against Ol Olama, who is of Middle Eastern descent. Two witnesses testified that they wi witnesses Brown shouted at Olama for over five minutes but did not hear any racist remark. Brown has come to you, a solicitor for legal advice. What advice would you give him? Very good, thank you, Karina. Can I just highlight again something in the facts? You will notice that the act specifically provides that bullying is repeated. Verbal, uh, verbal, uh, hang on, where's that? Physical, social, or psychological abuse. It has to be repeated, so a one-time thing is not bullying now if you look at the facts it appears it happened only once so people there are witnesses who said it did happen somebody was probably subjected to abuse we know that but it wasn't repeated so there is evidence of abuse but it wasn't repeated abuse what do you think What do you think? What's the legal issue here? Even though there was a legal issue, mm -hmm. the, the, can two sta statements from two witnesses signify, um, signify the evidence to support the decision of Mm -hmm. Decision of the government, uh, gov decision of uh, Mr. Brown's mm. um, dismissal. Mm -hmm. So we, we acknowledge, we admit that there is evidence to support that there has been abuse. It seems to have happened. The question though is, you know, does that comply with the requirements of the law? Because the law says bullying is repeated abuse. Well, there is no evidence that the bullying was, was um, occurred repeatedly. Mm, okay, go on. So, um, so I wouldn't say that is a, we we classified as a bully. Mm. And it's not enough to dismiss Mr. Brown from work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what is the legal issue here? The, um, does the shouting um, meet the definition of bullying? Okay, we're getting there. Within the, yeah, within the scope of the act. And also, mm -hmm. if, if that uh, five minutes of shouting enough evidence to support the decision to dismiss, dismiss Mr. Brown. Okay, we're, very, we're getting very close there. That's very good. Well, what's the legal principle that we need to cite here? Because we need, if it, when you identify the legal principle, our goal is to be able to state the legal rules, not just go back to the facts. What is the legal rule here? 
So if, if we look at it, for the act to be applicable in this particular case, for the Work Safety Act Commonwealth to be the basis for a decision, the requirement is that bullying must be repeated, must be repeated verbal, physical, social, or psychological abuse. So that is a jurisdictional requirement of the act. In other words, if that jurisdictional requirement is not met, the act is inapplicable. Okay. And we know that it's, it happened only one time. There is evidence of abuse, but it only happened one time. So we can see from the facts that, you know, um, there seems to be a problem with the decision because it is not compliant with the law, uh, with the requirements of the Work Safety Act. So perhaps one way of uh, stating the legal issue would be whether or not the decision uh, has met the requirement of uh, the, of the has met has has met the jurisdictional factual requirements under the act about bullying because if it does not then we can say that uh, there would be a ground for judicial review there would be a ground for judicial review so in other words when we speak of no evidence as a legal rule we're not just looking at the evidence but oftentimes we also need to examine whether certain factual requirements actually occur or actually are present. So it's one thing to talk about evidence in relation to uh, whether or not an event happened. There's also a requirement that there must be evidence to support the use of a particular enactment. And so in relation to, to that particular issue, whether or not the, the jurisdictional factual requirement in relation to the Work Safety Act uh, has been met, um, we will see that as a matter of legal principle, where a jurisdictional fact is required to be present before a particular act or, or statute or enactment can be resorted to, the absence of that jurisdictional fact will mean that um, there would be an absence of evidence to support a decision. So under the facts, therefore, we will see that the act provides that bullying must be repeated. And yet what that happened was that while there was abuse, the abuse was only happened one time. It wasn't repeated. So therefore, the jurisdictional factual requirement under the act that bullying must be repeated could not be established or is absent. Therefore, there is no evidence to support the decision that the Work Safety Act as a jurisdictional fact has been met. And the case for that would be the case of Timbara Protection Coalition Incorporated versus Rose Mining. Okay, it's now 7.03. I think this might be a good time to end. Any questions before we end tonight's session? And I will post the suggested answers in Moodle tonight. No, thank you very much as usual. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Is, there, is, yeah. there a, is there a chance for a couple of questions after you've finished the recording? Sure. Okay. So I'll end the, shall I end the recording now? And then, you know, if you want to stay on, do stay on, but I'm going to turn on the recording now. So thank you for those uh, who'll be watching the, this video. Thanks for joining us. See you later. I'm, I'm going to stay on uh, in case you have some questions.